For 200 years, a single family dominated India and astonished the world. A family known to history as the Great Moguls. The Khyber Pass, famous not only for its wild, romantic scenery, but also because this is the gateway from rugged Afghanistan to the riches of India. Through these mountains have come a succession of great conquerors, restless for new lands to plunder. Alexander the Great came by, so did Genghis Khan, and Tamburlaine. And if today the armed men are more local, in recent years most often the Mujahideen from Afghanistan, this remains a dangerous and exciting place, with the promise, once over the top, of India. The first large town through the pass is Peshawar, now in northwest Pakistan. This has always been a busy meeting place of merchants and adventurers, and no doubt the armies of those conquerors contributed their bit too to the racial mix, passing back through here with the spoils of India on their way home. <laughs> But one conqueror who came through here in the 16th century intended to stay in India. He was a buccaneer with royal blood in his veins. His name was Babur. Babur had a direct link with those earlier conquerors, being descended on one side from the leader of the Mongols, Genghis Khan, and on the other from that equally ferocious predator, Tamburlaine. But his own descendants would rule with even greater splendor. Their court in India became famous throughout the world for its lavish display, astounding the European visitors who witnessed this scene and who would call these emperors the Great Moguls, meaning the Great Mongols. Their exquisite paintings and buildings, together with often grisly deeds of treachery, would add up to an irresistibly exotic oriental melodrama. The family liked to imply that they ruled almost the whole world, enabling the lion to lie down with the lamb, but the early days of Babur himself had been very much humbler. His father had ruled a small kingdom to the north of Afghanistan, but he died when Babur was only 11, and his inheritance was grabbed by a stronger neighbor. By his late teens, Babur was living more like a bandit than a prince. He and a few followers would roam around seizing cattle, territory, wealth of any kind. In such a violent world, the villages and towns were all fortified, as indeed most of them still are today. And Babur describes vividly in his diary how he and his men would ride out at night to attack just such a place as this. Under cover of darkness, they would place their ladders against the wall. Often they were seen and had to ride away disappointed. But sometimes they got in, and then... After an exhilarating hand-to-hand -hand fight in narrow lanes, they would take what they fancied, or perhaps persuade this particular village to join their league. Barbour's following steadily increased. He was a leader who inspired great loyalty. And then there came a great breakthrough. In 1504, when he was 21, he captured a rich, sophisticated city, one which he would hold for the rest of his life, and which he came to think of as his real home. 
It was Kabul, now the capital of Afghanistan. Set among mountains to the west of the Khyber Pass, here was an ancient city in which Babur and his followers could settle down to a more civilized existence. The main cultural influence on this part of the world came from Persia. Babur, himself a keen poet and gardener, was able now to indulge in traditional Persian pleasures, of a kind which he and his family would later introduce to India. But a ruler in those days could never relax for long. A regime based only on military power needed constant new conquests to bring in more territory, more wealth. In three directions, Babur's kingdom at Kabul was unable to expand. To the north was a powerful new ruler who had been grabbing vast territories, including Babur's ancestral kingdom. To the west was the even more powerful empire of Persia. To the south, desert. That left only the east through the Khyber Pass. Northern India was ruled by many rival princes, too busy fighting each other to be likely to combine against an invader, and the prize was a rich one. India was fertile, and an army could advance unopposed in these vast plains after victory in a single pitched battle. When the time for that battle came, Babur would have one great advantage, a magic new weapon. In Dara, just through the Khyber Pass, firearms are the stock in trade. Everyone here is busy making them. But when Babur came this way with his new muskets, which had reached him from Persia, no one knew what these strange objects were. He describes tribesmen making obscene gestures at this weapon that fired no arrow until it went off in their direction. Nearly 500 years later, the magic of the musket may have been explained away, but it remains as important as ever to get hold of a good weapon, and people here will drill whatever barrel you require. Every day, as the customers try out the wares, the valley resounds with gunfire. In addition to his muskets, Babur had some very elementary artillery. He had a Turkish gunner by the name of Ustad, meaning master, who'd been able to cast a mortar for him. A tubby vessel, something the shape of a deep vase, which when tilted upwards could fire a large stone for almost a mile. Babo had vastly enjoyed watching the hot metal being poured to cast this ultimate deterrent, and he loved the excitement when it was fired. The mortar could only manage 12 shots a day, so each one was something of an event, of which Babo kept himself well informed. A typical entry in his diary reads, At the midday prayer, a person came from Ustad, saying, The stone is ready. What is the order? The order was, Fire this stone off, but keep the next till I come. But if the big mortar was just a wonderful toy, it was the muskets which would make the real difference. When Babur advanced into India, he would face a vast array of elephants and cavalry, a living force far greater than anything that he could match. But with his muskets, he was able to rely on a tactic which is now familiar to all of us from countless westerns. He lashed together 800 wagons with rawhide ropes, and behind this barricade, his musketeers only had to wait till the vast, glittering ranks of Indian elephants and cavalry came within range.
After his victory, Babur moved unopposed to the heart of northern India, through Delhi and onto the city which more than any other is now associated with the great moguls. All the famous buildings here in Agra were created for Babur's descendants and their families. The Taj Mahal is but one of many. In this city, which would later display to the world his family's magnificence, Babur had a foretaste of the wealth of India. Among the booty captured here was a rather large diamond, the Koh i Noor, which is now the jewel in the crown of the British crown jewels. Babur was a keen observer of the world about him, and soon he was finding much to marvel at in this land which he had so rapidly conquered. Here was a culture entirely different from the Muslim world, which had so far been the limit of his own experience, a scene of colourful and noisy ritual, and one in which women, whether in stone or in flesh, played a far more visible role, as here in a temple in Udaipur. The Hindu religion developed much earlier than Islam, and this sort of thing was exactly what the Quran, like the Old Testament, most strongly disapproved of: idols. But Babur was too fascinated by life to waste much time on indignation. Instead, he was soon writing a section in his diary entitled "Description of India." It begins boldly: "India, he notes, is extensive, full of people, and full of produce." It was the profusion and colour of life in India that most amazed Babur, as indeed it does any visitor today. And he was astonished by the number of craftsmen, though he does complain that it was impossible to get a decent pair of trousers made. With all wealth depending, in the end, on what the land and human skill can produce, it was perfectly evident that there were better pickings to be had here than in Afghanistan. Though in India's summer heat, Babur did always feel dreadfully homesick for the mountains of his youth. The Hindu city of Gwalior, 80 miles south of Agra, was a place where Babur noted down his impressions in great detail. He first came here on September the 27th, 1528. That day he had earache and so had taken opium, which was causing him to vomit when he visited this great fort. But like any good tourist, he put up with that. The palace had been completed only 20 years earlier, and it greatly impressed Babur. He noted the tiles, which included, he said, the semblance of banana trees. What struck him most was the work of the masons. These were, he wrote, wonderful buildings, entirely of hewn stone. Indian masons have always treated blocks of sandstone 
as freely as carpenters in other countries shape and carve planks of oak. Here in these courtyards was a Hindu architectural tradition which Babur's grandson, the Emperor Akbar, would later put to excellent effect. There was one aspect of Gwalior which deeply displeased Babur, the famous Jain carvings in the rock face. These idols, confided the Emperor to his diary, are shown quite naked, without covering for the privities. I, for my part, ordered them to be destroyed. Upon his orders, the faces and the offending privities were smashed. Modern restorers seem to have partly agreed with him. Only the faces have been replaced. The illustrations, done later for his diary, reflect Babur's fascination with the wildlife of India, though the artists don't always seem to have studied nature as closely as he might have wished. One frequent complaint in his text is the lack in India of good, cool streams. All the Mughal emperors loved water, and where they didn't find it in nature, they set about providing it in gardens. This garden in Agra, the Rambagh, is believed to have been laid out by Babur himself. It follows the rectangular system of the water gardens of Persia, just as in the paintings. Water flows through the channels laid for it and tumbles and trickles into pools as the engineer carries out the plans approved by Babur himself. He had made several such gardens in Kabul and the ones he created here in India no doubt helped to remind him of home. Babur would come to his gardens for a task which he very much enjoyed, that of writing up his diary from the notes he had taken all his life. And the tale he had to tell was among the most romantic of life's basic plots, the rags to riches story, from the early days, with sometimes just a couple of hundred followers, to all the wealth of India. And it was here in Agra that he decided to celebrate his success. He would give a sort of empire warming party. Word was sent out that all who had helped him on his way should come to receive fitting benefits. Even quite humble people were invited. A man who had once helped him across a river on a raft. Some peasants who had sheltered him in Afghanistan. It took a couple of years for all the guests to arrive. And then there was a huge feast with Babur under a pavilion in the centre, and the guests stretched out in a great semicircle of a hundred yards or more. There was much present giving, and dancing, and acrobatics, and general self-satisfaction. In India's climate, most celebrations still take place in the open air. From everyday picnics to more special occasions, a meal on the grass or on carpets remains a part of social life. It's nearly 500 years now since Babur's great feast, but the music, the food and the clothes here today are still true to the past, though at Babur's party the only women would have been the dancing girls. But his celebrations were premature, because the new empire depended far too much on Babur himself. Two years after the feast, he died. 
His had been an action-packed life. He was still only 47. And though his dynasty would later prosper, as this painting reveals, it was to be a close-run thing. He was succeeded by his son, Humayun, aged 22, who had fought beside his father in the capture of northern India, but was a very different character. Humayun had nothing of his father's brisk energy. He was charming, sentimental, much given to scenes of tearful reconciliation with those who had conspired against him, and superstitious, exceedingly superstitious. The superstition that dominated Humayun's life was one that is still an everyday feature of India. This marriage procession, a familiar sight in the streets here, couldn't possibly happen without the precise time being chosen in advance by an astrologer. The mysterious compulsion to have one's horoscope done is not confined to the East. But Humayun tried to organize his entire civil service by the signs of the zodiac. Far more ambitious than the simple personal attention that most people want from the astrologer. In Humayun's astrological civil service, the officials responsible for the earth signs naturally took charge of agriculture. The water signs had the canals, while the far people busied themselves with military matters. But astrology won few battles, and soon the Mughal armies were suffering some unpleasant shocks. Humayun himself had to make several humiliating departures from the battlefield, including one hurried escape across the Ganges, hanging on to an inflated goatskin. The empire, which he had inherited from his father in 1530, extended far across northern India. Ten years later, he had lost control of the whole of it and was wandering as a refugee in the deserts of Rajasthan with his family and a dwindling band of courtiers. Their circumstances were already bleak, but there was worse to come. In the heat of the desert, there is no greater relief than to come across a working well. But this was to be an increasingly rare sight that summer for Humayun and his family. They began to find that most of the wells they came across were dry. They had been filled with sand, the buckets were clogged and empty. The cause was a clash with Hindus. Members of Humayun's party had killed some cows, sacred animals to any Hindu. Rajasthan is a fiercely Hindu territory, and the people here had been deeply offended. It was because of this sacrilege that the wells were being filled by followers of the ruler of Jaisalmer, one of the great desert strongholds of Rajasthan. This kingdom was just the sort of place Humayun's descendants would have to come to terms with if they were to recover and hold India. But for the moment, mere survival had become the one priority for the evicted emperor and his family. They plodded hopelessly on. Though one small miracle, which was often later retold with delight in family history, did seem like a good omen. A young wife of whom I owns was just 15 years old, but was also eight months pregnant. And she now felt that famous arbitrary longing of pregnancy for one particular kind of food. In her case, a pomegranate, something impossible to come by in the desert. But then, happily, their path crossed with that of a travelling merchant. And he was found to have, in his saddlebag, one large, juicy pomegranate. Then, a month later, at a small oasis, the real miracle. The birth of a son who would later radically transform the family's fortunes. They called him Akbar. He would spend his childhood as a refugee because his father would soon be chased right out of India. But against all the odds, Humayun later fought his way back in to recover the empire. And Akbar, the child of the desert, would grow up to deserve, more than any other member of his family, that simple but resounding title the great mogul.
The powerful fort of Rotas in Pakistan was built during the boyhood of Akbar, the greatest of the great moguls. But it was built by a rival who had driven Akbar's father from India, a mere 15 years after the family had conquered the land. The Mughal Empire now seemed little more than a nine days wonder. But then India fell once more into chaos, and Akbar's father managed to fight his way back past here to recover his kingdom. It was the plains of northern India which the Mughal family had conquered in 1526, and which Akbar's father, Humayun, now recovered, settling back into his capital city at Delhi. It was only just in time, for six months later he was dead, but at least that meant it was here in Delhi that his tomb would rise as the first of the great Mughal monuments, giving a reassuring, if so far entirely false, sense of stability and power. Above the tomb, a dome, like a bud which would later flower in the dome of the Taj Mahal, reflecting the Persian traditions behind the Mughal family. Poetry played an important part in Persian court life, and with pleasures such as these, Humayun now relaxed once again in Delhi. As well as reading poems, a favourite game was to improvise them, and naturally his reconquest of India was the most popular subject of all. It was into this building that Humayun now moved his precious collection of family manuscripts. This was the scene of the poetry readings, but the scene also of a disastrous accident. One day in 1556, Humayun was up here on the roof of his library. He'd been hearing the latest news from Mecca, from some pilgrims who had recently returned, and he was discussing with his astrologers the hour at which they expected Venus to rise, because he intended to hold an assembly at that propitious moment. And when that time had been agreed, he began to go down these steep stone steps. And then, something which the astrologers had evidently not foreseen. His foot was on the second step, when he heard a muezzin from the nearby mosque calling the faithful to prayer. And as Humayun turned to incline his knee in respect, he tripped in his robe and fell headlong down. He died three days later. And in such an unstable empire, the sudden death of the emperor automatically meant a political crisis. Humayun's son, Akbar, was already an experienced soldier, even though he was still only 13 years old. But he happened to be hundreds of miles away campaigning in the Punjab. If the news got out before Akbar was publicly enthroned, it was certain that others would attempt to seize power. As the first rumours spread, anxious crowds gathered below the fort. So Humayun's courtiers fell back on an ancient ruse. Someone who vaguely resembled the dead emperor was dressed up in his clothes and waved reassuringly at the crowd at a suitable distance. No doubt some of the people were fooled for some of the time. And meanwhile, the action had moved elsewhere. When the news reached Akbar, he was miles from anywhere in this vast plain. He had with him an experienced general to keep an eye on the boy, and the general now organised a hurried but essential ceremony. There had to be a coronation. The king is dead, long live the king. It's quite a pilgrimage now to get to the platform which commemorates that event. Known as the Throne of Akbar, this surely has to be the least visited of all Mughal monuments. Well, here at last it is, with just some water buffaloes now standing where the courtiers did on that distant day, and a rather brutal Ministry of Works fence separating it from the surrounding countryside. It's in a very dilapidated state, but you can just see how it must have been as a Mughal monument. Here, for example, water would have come rippling down over a carved stone, a very Mughal detail. Dreary though this looks, it's a most evocative place, because that event, here in the middle of nowhere in 1556, 
was to be the turning point for Akbar's family, leading to more than a hundred years of astonishing achievements. But on the face of it, as he sat here that day in a golden robe specially made for the occasion, the prospect was bleak. It was only to his own army grouped around him that he was emperor. Others would have different ideas. His claim to rule was not that strong. His father and his grandfather had between them notched up only 15 years ruling in India. And there were plenty of rival rulers who would now see a young boy on the throne as just the chance they'd been waiting for. As proof of that, it wasn't long after Humayun's death before a large Hindu army captured Delhi and then moved in this direction to drive Akbar from India. In the resulting battle, the Mughals were heavily outnumbered. And if they'd lost that battle, there would have been no Mughal Empire. In the event, they were saved by a stroke of luck. A chance arrow hit the Hindu general in the eye. And the sight of him, slumped so visibly on top of his elephant, caused his army to flee. On such small incidents, the tide of events can turn. By the end of the battle, the Mughals had captured nearly 1,500 elephants. And it was like that many tanks, in perfect condition and with plenty of fuel and ammunition, falling into the hands of a modern army. So Akbar and the elephants were able to march back together into Delhi, for the moment unopposed. After the victory, a tower was built using the heads of the enemy, a custom whenever the defeated were non-Muslims. Rotting by the roadside, this was not a tradition well calculated to appease the local community. The young Akbar, on the face of it, seemed unlikely to appease anything. Physical danger was what he loved. Indeed, he'd been so much the athletic schoolboy that he never even learnt to read. Yet this was the emperor, Akbar, who had come to see the problems of India with its rival communities of Muslims and Hindus in a new and very unconventional light, shocking many of his own Muslim followers in the process. The great centre of Hindu power lay to the southwest of Delhi, in the area known as Rajasthan, the land of the Rajas. Their fortresses dotted this ancient and highly colourful territory, and two in particular would be of great importance to Akbar, Chittor and Amber, which is now known as Jaipur. of this fort in Rajasthan there is a most unusual feature, a seat. It's perfect now for enjoying a quite spectacular view but that wasn't its purpose. It seems that this was a throne for use in times of siege. Here the Maharaja would sit, exposed but visibly in command, conducting the campaign if there were enemies below to be driven back. From this perfect vantage point he could see the build up to an assault and choose where to fling his own men into the attack. Oh, this is a 
The ferocity of the fighting men of Rajasthan, the famous Rajputs, was legendary. They were known as the greatest warriors in all India, reckless in their courage, a reputation sustained by their habit of going into battle high on opium. These were people that Akbar would either have to subdue or make friends with. The rulers of this particular fort later became known as the Maharajas of Jaipur. They came to terms with Akbar. And the beauty of their city, the largest in Rajasthan, suggests that there were advantages in doing so. Jaipur was built as a completely new city after two centuries of alliance with the Mughals. It all began with a marriage. At an Indian wedding, even today, the bridegroom, with a small male relation mounted in front of him, goes on horseback to meet his bride. But when Akbar took a wife, from the ruling family here in 1562, it was out of the question that he should ride to her. It was she who was sent to him. To present a bride to Akbar was a way of making an alliance, in effect like signing a treaty. And as he travelled round with his court, building up his fragile empire, he made many such arrangements. His harem contained some 5,000 women, mostly slave girls. Among his wives there were several Hindu princesses, each a token of friendship from her own family. But the first had been the bride from Jaipur, and beneath the fort there would soon appear the famous palace of Amber, the first unmistakable sign of a new prosperity. It was built some 40 years after the wedding by a Maharaja who had become Akbar's leading general. His palace has become one of the great sights of India. For the tourists, an elephant ride up to Amber is a compulsory item on everyone's schedule. The most impressive details were naturally in the Maharaja's own quarters, with patterns of inlaid stones and fragments of mirror. Here, in pavilions placed between the public part of the palace to one side and the harem to the other, the ruler could entertain either outside visitors or his own women in surroundings that would delight them all. A few miles away, in their new city of Jaipur, the Maharajas of Amber would build another palace. And it's here that their present-day descendant lives. I asked him what benefits he felt there had been for either side in the family's long relationship with the Mughal emperors. The uh, Mughals got governors and generalship from the House of Amber, and uh, the House of Amber got the uh, peace and tranquility to be able to pursue and build the city of Jaipur and um, was again considered one of the main uh, Hindu and Rajput states of that period. And what about religion? Well, again, it uh, gave Raja Jaising great time to protect the Hindu religion during his reign. Akbar spent much of his time moving round with a vast army, using the sport of hunting as his diplomatic cover. Any troublesome ruler might soon find the emperor killing deer on his own doorstep, with the infantry standing in as beaters. One of the ways of hunting that the emperor most enjoyed was with the cheetah, the Indian leopard. 
the fastest animal on earth. It can be unleashed for the kill like a hawk. This crowded scene with a fence in the background depicts another favourite way of hunting. Akbar's soldiers would drive the deer in from miles around in an ever-shrinking circle. Then, as soon as the terrified animals were contained in a small enough space, the portable fence would be put up around them. And riding in with sword or lance or gun, the emperor would indulge in an orgy of killing. On one occasion, on a vast plain such as this, 50,000 beaters drove in game from 60 miles around, a very large army in disguise. No wonder most rulers proved friendly when Akbar passed by. But there were exceptions, in particular the Rana of Mewa, who held the great fort of Chittor. As the senior prince of Rajasthan, he openly scorned the house of Amber for having given a daughter to the Mughal harem. Akbar determined that this proud knee must bend. In 1567, he arrived below the fort with his army, which included Hindu princes from Amber. Chittor itself is nearly four miles long, but Akbar's camp extended ten miles. It was to be one of the most famous sieges in Indian history. Akbar used two methods of assault, both of which are shown in these views done by his painters. One was mining, burrowing under the walls with explosives. The idea was to blow up a section for the soldiers to enter the fort. But fuses were unreliable, and the Mughal army suffered a major disaster when a charge went off in two stages. The first blew the intended hole in the wall, but the second exploded as the Mughals stormed the breach, killing several of Akbar's favourite officers. The other method was a fortified corridor, which was gradually extended until it reached the walls. From its protection, snipers, often including Akbar himself, would get closer and closer shots at the defenders. For four months, this daily trial of strength dragged painfully on. The siege came to a sudden end because of a single bullet. There had appeared on the ramparts on that particular day a Hindu officer. And in the way of the times, the bullet that killed him was soon credited to the gun of the emperor himself. It's true that Akbar did take an active part in the daily business of sniping at the fort, and it may well be that he did fire the lucky shot. But the significance of what had happened was not immediately appreciated in the Mughal camp, until they observed that fires were breaking out all over the fort. Then the Hindu generals in Akbar's army were able to explain to him what was happening. The man who had died must have been the prince in command of the fort. And the fires were part of a grisly but hallowed Rajput ceremony, which always took place whenever defeat seemed inevitable. Yani, ki hum jab Rajput haar jate hain, to bhi hamari Rajput parivar ki striyan Johar mein jalti hain. Johar shabd ka matlab The Johar, described to every visitor here, is the favorite incident in Chittor's history, a symbol of the unyielding pride of Rajasthan. For the wives of Rajput warriors, death rather than dishonor was the compulsory tradition in the face of defeat. They were all burnt before their husbands sallied forth to meet their own equally certain end in a final hopeless battle. Inside the fort there were some 40,000 peasants living and, unusually for him, Akbar now allowed them too to be massacred. Clearly this victory over the uncompromising Rana of Mewa was to be taken as an example. The city of Udaipur reveals that the Rana himself compromised in a rather different way. He had left his men to defend Chittor while he withdrew to start again here further removed from the centers of Mughal power. An unglamorous decision, but it preserved the independence of his house, which never intermarried with the Mughals, and it gave us one of India's most beautiful cities. Today, the Rana of Mewa still feels it a matter of pride that the Mughals were kept at arm's length. 
Now, we knew that if we were going to compromise with the Mughals, we would not be allowed to live with any self-respect in the Mughal court, and therefore we were very keen to protect our self-respect. The other reason is that our family is religious, deeply religious, and we believe in the values set out in Hinduism. And people look up to our family as the custodians of Hinduism. And whenever the Hindu faith and the Hindu religion was threatened, we were not prepared to compromise, and we fought for uh, protecting the faith. To celebrate his victory over the Hindus of Chittor, Akbar made a pilgrimage to a great Muslim shrine. It was to Ajmer that he went, to visit the tomb of a saint who had brought to India the more tolerant strain of Islam known as Sufism. His shrine remains a holy place today. The saint here had died three centuries before Akbar's visit. But it was to be a living saint who had now become of great importance to the emperor. Fatapur Sikri is on the itinerary of most visitors to India today. But in the mid-16th century, it was just a minor place of pilgrimage. There was a saint living here of the same tolerant sect as the saint at Ajmer. And like other holy men, he would receive visits from those seeking comfort or advice. In 1568, one of the pilgrims who came for advice was the young emperor, who would later build, at the top of these steps, the great victory gateway leading into the mosque. When Akbar came to visit the saint who lived near here, he brought him a pressing problem. He was now 26, but in spite of his large number of wives, he still had no son. Well, the saint gave an uncompromising answer. Without hedging his bets, in the usual way of soothsayers, he declared categorically that the emperor would have not one son, but three. Soon after these comforting words, news came that the Hindu princess from Amber was pregnant. For safety's sake, Akbar sent her to live near the saint, and here a boy was born. A year later, another princess was pregnant. She too was sent here, another son. And two years after that, a third boy, exactly fulfilling the saint's prophecy. But with a track record like that, an emperor does not stand idle. And that was why, over the next few years, Fatifor Sikri became increasingly important in Akbar's life. The palace, which Akbar would now build beside this mosque, was a gesture of gratitude to the saint, of confidence in the future, and of exuberance. An exuberance reflected, it's pleasant to imagine, in an entertainment offered to the visitors here by one particular old man, several times a day. When Akbar began to build here at Fatipur Sikri, he had been 17 years on the throne. Since that hurried coronation as a boy in the plains of the Punjab, he had turned his shaky inheritance into a stable empire. He was just 30, and there was still much to achieve. But now, with those three sons born here, there would be someone to pass it all on to. His family's future had never looked better. The hilltop round the mosque at Fatipur Sikri was bare in the 16th century. Then at amazing speed an extraordinary group of buildings appeared here. The heart of an empire, all bustle and business. But that lasted just 14 years after which the place was deserted and it's remained so ever since. This is not a ghost city, it's a ghost palace. In these courtyards, the Emperor Akbar created his own very original concept of a place where a ruler could feel really at home. Akbar decided to build here because of a local holy man, or saint, so the mosque was always central to Fatipur Sikri. 
The saint died soon after the building work began, but then a saint's tomb, properly tended, can be almost as propitious as the saint himself. Clad in fine white marble, which was added by Akbar's grandson, the tomb is the centerpiece of the courtyard. A daily custom in the shrine, out of sight behind the carved marble screens, reveals precisely why Fatapur Sikri was built. Women tie threads to the screen. Each is a wish for a child. A reminder that when Akbar came here without an heir, the saint told him he would have three boys. And when he did, the builders were called in. Akbar chose a Hindu style of architecture. And no doubt most of his laborers were Hindus too. Certainly the women. <laughs> This is still a familiar sight anywhere in India. And if it looks now a little slow compared to methods elsewhere, nobody could have said that about the building of Fatipur Sikri, where it took just a few years to create a palace worthy of an increasingly confident emperor. This was the area over which Akbar, at the age of 13, had inherited very shaky control. And this was the stable empire which he in his turn would hand on some 50 years later. Delhi had been his father's capital. Agra would eventually become his own. So the saint's home at Fatipur Sikri, in addition to being so propitious, was strategically placed at the heart of the empire. A visit to Fatipur Sikri is the best way of discovering the kind of life that went on around a Mughal emperor. Yes, coming. There were even more barriers then, from the Mughals to the British to today. There is nothing new about Indian bureaucracy. We take it for granted now that you can walk straight into any town. But in those days, the town gate was a real obstacle, always shut, for example, at night. This next gate was the entrance to the palace itself. Whenever the emperor came through here, there were musicians playing for him in the room above. But for the rest of us, the name of this one has a somewhat familiar ring. It was known as the Naubat Khane, which means roughly the house of taking one's place in the queue. Well, there's little danger of a queue today because now hardly anything comes through here except tourist buses. But then, as the remains of these shops reveals, this was a bustling commercial thoroughfare. The traders can be seen in this painting and beyond them the next gate. The Fatipur Sikri was a series of concentric circles. With the emperor at the center, each circle became more private, more difficult to get into. It wasn't till this courtyard that you might catch a glimpse of the emperor himself. He would appear here each morning to hold public audience from his raised throne pavilion on the far side. This is Divane Am, the hall of public audience. Emperor used to sit in the center and both side ladies and downside all ministers, public used to sit there. The public consisted largely of officials who attended to hear the judgments or decisions that the emperor had made in private council. In the next courtyard stands the extraordinary building which Akbar devised for that private council. It has an interior which is no use at all to anyone except an emperor. It's a single high room with this massive pillar in the center. Down below would stand those who are going to hear the emperor's discussions, but not take part in them. Clerks, for example, recording what was said. The purpose of this great pillar is not immediately clear. 
In fact, it's a very high throne, as can be seen from above. The one flaw in this otherwise splendid design is that to reach his throne, the emperor had to climb some astonishingly steep stairs. But once he'd got to the top, a very different prospect and a quite extraordinary seating arrangement. There are places to sit all round the edges and four bridges to the throne in the center. If someone needed to talk more intimately with the emperor or to take him something of interest to look at, he would cross one of the bridges, no doubt stooping humbly as he went, which does also make it feel a lot safer, to where Akbar sat on plump and comfortable cushions. The whole arrangement seems custom built for an egomaniac, which is exactly what it was. But then emperors and modesty have never gone hand in hand, and this does feel exceptionally good. Akbar loved in particular talking about religion, on which he was very much a free thinker, unlike his predecessors. He refused to accept that his own creed, Islam, could have a monopoly of the truth. And he enraged his experts on the Quran by making them discuss, in here, the nature of God. Not just among themselves, but in argument with Hindu gurus, who would sit on the opposite side. The final straw for the Orthodox Muslims was when Akbar introduced his own religion. It borrowed something from each of the others, but added one startling new element, in that Akbar himself seemed to have taken over the role of God. Close to Akbar's eccentric hall of private audience, there is a five-story building. It stood on the borderline between the male world of Akbar's imperial responsibilities and the feminine part of the palace, the harem, which lies beyond. This is the Panch Mahal, five-story building. Summer palace for the ladies. This As the guide explains, this lovely, cool palace without walls was probably used on special occasions, such as parties, by Akbar and his profusion of ladies. The women would come to it from their enclosed quarters beyond, an area into which in those days no man, except the emperor himself and male members of the family, would ever go. Akbar provided intricately carved surroundings for his harem, which included both Muslim and Hindu wives. But the method of construction at Fatipur Sikri is entirely Hindu, with the straight lines of great stone pillars and beams instead of Muslim curves. These rooms were lovely places to loll and chat in on a warm evening. If they look a bit stark now, it's because they're unfurnished. This is like viewing an empty flat, and as on that occasion, the trick is to imagine the missing items. Not just the girls themselves, but pretty things in the alcoves, cushions to recline among, and above all, carpets. An English visitor to India marvelled at the rich display of carpets. All their bravery, he wrote, is upon their floors. In many Indian villages, carpet making in the traditional way is still an important industry. The sound here is that of the various foremen, calling out which colour of wool is to go where to form the pattern. The daily life of Akbar's court is known to us in great detail thanks to one man, a fascinating character, a writer who became a close friend of the emperor. His name was Abul Fazl. In Fatipur Sikri, at a discreet distance from the harem, is this house. It's believed to be the one in which Abul Fazl lived. He'd come to court in his early twenties, and his great intelligence, combined with an almost unlimited willingness to lay on flattery with a trowel, both of them qualities which endeared him to Akbar, 
meant that he soon became, in effect, the emperor's resident intellectual. The great task which Akbar entrusted to him was the recording for posterity of his life and possessions and achievements. And these three fat volumes are less than half of what Abul Fazl wrote. Indeed, in the printed version, his work amounts to some 4,000 pages. The greater part of that is his history of Akbar's reign. And this was a project organized with a thoroughness typical of the emperor. Orders were given that all his elderly relations and the oldest palace servants should write down everything they could remember about the past. As to the present, there were now to be two scribes on duty every minute of the day, noting down everything that happened. An Englishman visiting the Mughal court wrote that no part of the emperor's day goes unrecorded. No, not so much as he's going to the necessary, or how often he lies with his wives, and with whom, so that it may appear in the chronicles. Well, the chronicles were what Abul Fazl provided, and illustrating them became the most important task for Akbar's great studio of painters. In this house there lives a family of painters who have practiced their craft here for generations, for the most part producing images in the traditional styles of the past. Among the many schools of Indian art, the greatest is that of the Mughal court established by Akbar. His painters would often collaborate on a picture. Each would put in what he did best, someone for the landscape or the architecture, and later someone else for lavish costumes or animals or flowers. And always someone for the most skillful task of all, the faces. They had to be recognizable. What Akbar looked for in a painting was an accurate image of the life that he knew. He took a keen personal interest in his painters. Pictures were regularly brought to him for his comments or approval. As a result, the work of his studio adds up to a fascinating visual archive of how things were done. In his great work, Abul Fazl also collected masses of dusty information about the empire and how it functioned. Statistics, for example. There are columns and columns of them, and they run on for page after page after page. And then there are fascinating nuggets of very unexpected information. The ranks of the camels and their servants, or regulations for oiling camels and injecting oil into their nostrils. Whenever anything worth having has been invented, it's invariably credited to Akbar himself. Under the manner of cleaning guns, we learn that this used to be a most laborious task. But His Majesty, from his practical knowledge, has invented a wheel, by the motion of which 16 barrels may be cleaned in a very short time. The wheel is turned by a cow. And then there are fascinating details about Akbar's daily routine. We learn that he never drank anything but water from the Ganges, which was carried with him wherever he went. And he had the great luxury of ice arriving every day of the hot Indian summer in an endless succession of boats and carts from the distant Himalayas. He only had one meal a day, but the fuss that caused was phenomenal on its long journey from the kitchen. India's housewives still prepare dishes for their husbands to take to work in that splendid Indian invention, the tiffin can. But Akbar's dishes were sealed for a different reason, fear of poison. Before sealing, each was tasted by three officials. If anyone was going to die in instant agony, it would not be Akbar. One of the greatest bonds between Abul Fazl and Akbar was a shared love of religious speculation. 
And Abra Fazl spends a great deal of space in this volume describing the beliefs of different religions. So both men were equally delighted when a third element was added to the discussions held here at Fatipur Sikri between Muslims and Hindus. There arrived from Goa something entirely new, a couple of Jesuit missionaries. Christian engravings had already begun appearing in the elegant scrapbooks kept by Mughal courtiers because the Portuguese had now been in Goa, on the west coast of India, for half a century. Distributing images of this kind was a part of missionary activity. The efforts of the missionaries did lead to some surprising juxtapositions. The companion for Jesus is Akbar's own son, Jahangir. Akbar's Muslim advisers were ordered by the emperor to engage in debate with the two visiting Christians. Akbar expected some sort of truth to emerge, vain hope. The Jesuits pitched into the Muslims with such vehemence that the emperor himself had to take them aside to advise caution. Even so, they stayed for three years in Fatipur Sikri, only leaving in despair when Akbar announced his own new religion. But at least they had provided some interesting new themes for Indian artists. Abul Fazl is seen here presenting part of his great work to the emperor. He never quite completed his history of the reign because he died three years before Akbar. This romantic place by the name of Orcha, a hundred or more miles south of Fatipur Sikri, was where Abul Fazl met a violent death. And how the free-thinking intellectual came to this improbable end at the hands of the man who ruled here requires some explanation. In what was essentially a military society, the only way of real progress to fame and fortune was by proving oneself in battle. So Abu Fazl used his influence with the emperor to be given military command, and soon he was in action. He seems to have reveled in skirmishes and sieges, Writing them up later, he invariably makes the most of his own involvement. Our brave warriors were nearly being defeated, he reports on one occasion, but the writer came up and the enemy was dispersed. Unfortunately, the brave writer had one powerful enemy on the Mughal side. He was Jahangir, the prince who shared the page of an album with Jesus. As the eldest son, he was Akbar's natural heir, but he had led a most dissolute youth and Abul Fazl had made no secret of his low opinion of him. Now the prince was showing signs of open rebellion. The emperor, Akbar, summoned Abul Fazl back from where he was campaigning in the south because he wanted his advice. But Jahangir knew that any such advice would be deeply hostile to his own interests. He decided to take action. Far to the south of Agra and Fatipur Sikri, Abul Fazl was busy campaigning on the distant borders of the empire when he received Akbar's summons to return to court. He set off, confident as ever, to advise his emperor. But his journey would lead him straight into an ambush. Jahangir was friends with the Raja who had his stronghold at Orcha. And he knew that Abul Fazl would have to pass by here on his way north. So he sent word that if the Raja would stop that sedition monger and kill him, he could expect every kindness from the prince. Abul Fazl and his small party were overwhelmed here by about 500 horsemen. He'd had advance warning of the ambush from a spy and it seems he could have escaped. But he was playing to the hilt his new role of Mughal warrior. He fought to the death. As proof that the deed was done, his head was sent to Jahangir. And tradition completes an unsavory tale by adding that the prince threw it into a latrine. I can't help identifying with the writer who'd worked so hard collecting facts to glorify the Mughal court. It was an unworthy end. A great new palace nearby at Adatia was begun by the Raja a few years after he had disposed of Abul Fazl. Its opulence suggests the scale of reward for political murder. 
The new building was in the same style as Fatipur Sikri, but ironically, Fatipur Sikri itself had already been abandoned. It seems the water supply had failed, so the imperial caravanserai moved on, leaving only the ghosts of a brief 14 years of glory. From 1584, Agra was where the emperor now once again made his headquarters, within the magnificent great sandstone walls which give the Red Fort its name. They were walls and gates which Akbar himself had built before his move to Fatipur Sikri. The last years of his life were darkened by the question of the succession. Akbar was now in his sixties, and he had no great liking for his son, Jahangir, the murderer of Abul Fazl. The rumour was that he might skip a generation. Jahangir had several sons. Was it perhaps in the old man's mind to pass the crown to one of them? Some tried to read the answer in one particular event. A favourite entertainment among the Mughals was the elephant fight, and Akbar now ordered a contest between the best elephant of Jahangir and the best elephant of Jahangir's eldest son. Many believed the result would decide which of them should inherit the crown. These elephants are high on the wall of the Red Fort at Agra, above where elephant fights invariably took place. Akbar sat up here watching, surrounded by courtiers, while the two elephants fought it out in the open space below. In the event, it was the elephant of his son, Jahangir, which won. A month later, Akbar died, and he did decree on his deathbed that Jahangir should succeed him. But the real person to have watched on that day of the elephant fight was a 13-year-old boy who sat up here beside his grandfather. He was a younger son of Jahangir, who had become known as Shah Jahan, and he would add a new and darker strain to his family's history. He would kill brothers, nephews, cousins on his path to the throne. After three generations of peaceful inheritance, the dynasty of the great Mughals was about to plunge into the most lurid of oriental melodramas. But first, a tomb for the emperor. Akbar's monument near Agra perfectly reflects his achievement. Parts are in the Hindu style, and parts in the Muslim tradition of arches and minarets. It's a mixture in keeping with Akbar's own vision of harmony between the two communities of India, and its imposing mood does justice to the man himself. He had indeed lived up to the bold name he had been given, for Akbar, in Arabic, is the everyday word for great. The lake of Pushkar in Rajasthan, one of the holiest places in India. Hindu pilgrims have been coming here for more than 1500 years. But Mughal emperors came too to see the pilgrims, in particular Akbar's son Jahangir. Jahangir loved to observe everything that went on in his empire, including the details of the various rituals. With Jahangir, a new element enters into the family history. He was the first great mogul to inherit a stable empire, which meant that he was also the first who from the start could relax and enjoy himself. That would involve throughout his life the consumption of far too much alcohol and opium, but it also meant that he could indulge a sceptical and inquiring mind. When he came here to Pushkar one day in 1615, he was told, as no doubt every visitor was, that this holy lake was bottomless. Well, the tourist is supposed to reply, how fascinating. Not Jahangir. He called for a plumb line, 
and sent men out in boats all over the lake. He was delighted to be able to prove that at no point was it more than 18 feet deep. But somewhere beneath these waters there are some pieces of broken stone which suggest a darker side to his character. He saw a Hindu idol which suddenly offended him. Imagine the consternation here when he had it smashed and thrown into the lake. The rain had begun with a grisly example of a sadistic streak in Jahangir. His eldest son mounted a feeble rebellion against him and in Jahangir's reaction there was too much of macabre humour. His son's two closest accomplices were sewn up in the wet skins of a newly slaughtered ox and ass, complete with head and ears, and were then seated on donkeys to be paraded all day through the streets. It was a death sentence with a built-in element of gamble. The question was whether the heat of the sun would shrink the skins enough to suffocate the men. By the end of the day, one of the two was dead. Meanwhile, the prince himself was being forced to ride an elephant down a street lined with stakes, on each of which one of his supporters was impaled alive. The prince was later foolish enough to attempt a second rebellion, and this time his father ordered him to be blinded. He would spend the rest of his life moving round with the court as a prisoner. From time to time, Jahangir did see him, but he noted in his diary he found the prince depressing. Fortunately, this strain of cruelty was to be rare in Jahangir's reign, though at the end of it, far greater family violence would break out. Before then, though, there were to be 20 years of peace and prosperity during which the arts of Mughal India would flourish as never before. Akbar had set up the imperial studio of painters, but under Jahangir they would excel in images of often outrageous political bravado. Here Jahangir embraces his great enemy, the Shah of Persia, but meanwhile the Mughal lion has nudged the Persian lamb right into the Mediterranean. Jahangir loved watching animals and birds and would note their habits in minute detail in his diary. But the diary is just as detailed about his own habits, recording with great precision his decline into alcoholism. From wine he turned to spirits and then to double distilled spirits. He was drinking 20 cups a day at one period with a dose of opium as well and he was at no pains to conceal this alarming fact. Indeed, he even had himself shown with a wine cup on one of his coins, deeply shocking to the Muslim faithful. Life in Jahangir's empire is known to us in great detail, partly because it was now receiving much foreign attention. Ships from Portugal, Holland and Britain were sailing right round Africa to visit this land of fabled wealth. It was from the port of Surat in 1615 that a very articulate Englishman set off inland on an arduous journey to seek out the emperor, who was with his army a few miles from Pushkar at the city of Ajmer. Actually, by a strange coincidence, there were two Englishmen here in Ajmer that winter of 1615. They couldn't have been more different, though they did decide to share lodgings. One was the first official British ambassador to India. King James I had sent him out to try and set up a trading agreement for the newly formed East India Company. The man chosen for this difficult task was Sir Thomas Rowe, and he describes how he met in Ajmer that famous unwearied walker, Tom Coriat. Coriat was a writer who had indeed spent three years walking to India, but was determined that his readers should see him on an elephant. He was lucky to be alive since his idea of good Christian behaviour was to climb the minaret in mosques and to shout down that Mohammed was an imposter. Rowe was soon deeply embarrassed by his eccentric compatriot. Coriat was something of a linguist and he now addressed to Jahangir a speech in Persian, which was fine until Rowe discovered what he was saying. He was asking the emperor for money, which Rowe considered unseemly in an Englishman. Rowe himself, by contrast, had brought presents for the emperor, which was essential for an ambassador because presents played a major part in Mughal court life. Indeed, Rowe describes how people would hold up in the air the gifts they had brought for Jahangir, and if something nice caught his fancy, he would ask that person what business he had come upon. 
Unfortunately, rose presents, which had been provided by the East India Company, turned out, when they were unpacked, to be mouldy, which provoked a very sharp letter home. Even so, he did make progress at court, and soon he was invited to one of Jahangir's evening parties. A guard at the entrance sniffed the breath of every guest in case he had been drinking, a somewhat hypocritical precaution, Rowe considered. And indeed, serious discussion of British trade did turn out to be quite impossible. The emperor was, in Rowe's words, too drowsy with the fumes of Bacchus. The day came when the whole imperial court was to move elsewhere. And Sir Thomas Rowe stood at this gate to watch the Emperor's departure. He was dazzled by the jewels which Jahangir wore for the journey. A huge ruby and emerald and diamond in his turban, three great double chains of pearls round his neck, diamond bracelets at wrists and elbows, and a ring on every finger. But there was one very gratifying touch, almost certainly unnoticed by anyone except Rowe himself. Amid all this finery, Tucked into Jahangir's belt was a pair of English gloves, which Roe had given him. And then, even better, the passed by Jahangir's chief wife, entirely concealed from sight in a closed English carriage, which Roe had brought out in parts to be assembled here. There was still hope, he thought to himself, as he took his place in the endless procession of carts and animals and riders which he calculated must take 12 hours to pass any single spot on the road. The emperor's own travelling palace itself needed 600 animals to move it from one place to the next. And when the whole city of tents was set up, Roe considered it one of the wonders of his experience. It was some 20 miles around. Here the daily life of court and government could be carried on just as in a permanent city of stone. After four months on the move, the royal caravan came to Mandu, a vast hill fortress where Jahangir now settled in for a prolonged stay. Here were palaces in which it was a joy to relax after the upheavals of travel. Mandu had been brought within the empire by Jahangir's father, but there had been Muslim rulers here long before the Mughals came to India. Jahangir was particularly impressed by the superb mosque which they had built in the 15th century. Today, in its corridor of arches, the sound is no longer that of prayers. It is the conversation of bats. Sir Thomas Rowe's first task after arriving in Mandu with Jahangir's court was to find lodgings. He couldn't afford the comfortable places that were being snapped up by the rich courtiers, so he set off to look for something within his own means. And eventually, he came across a deserted mosque, which he thought might just do him. And this is believed to be the very one. It's not exactly lavish, but he would make the best of it. First of all, putting screens across the entrances to keep out intruders, and particularly some that bothered him at night. There were lions prowling about. I like to think of him safely barricaded in here with his dwindling stock of presents for important people piled high in an alcove. Now he could get on with the real work of an ambassador, joining in life at court, being seen at the best parties, always trying to get the ear of the emperor. One of the most important parties was on the Emperor's birthday. Rowe managed to get an invitation and so saw a central event. The weighing of a member of the royal family against gold and then against silver and jewels. The idea was that his weight in each of these valuable commodities would be distributed to the poor. Rowe doubted that the money would really be handed out, but conspicuous generosity was good for the imperial image, and by now the empire was prosperous.
Nearly all rulers bring prosperity to the Masons as they build palaces for themselves or temples to God. Rather fewer do anything for the peasants. But Jahangir's father had successfully adjusted their taxes and so encouraged them to bring more land into cultivation. Jahangir loved his wealth, but simple holy men, he liked to pretend, meant more to him than anyone else. The Western monarch being snubbed here by his place at the back of the queue is James I of England, undoubtedly done from a painting brought by Sir Thomas Rowe. Maybe Rowe also got himself invited to a famous party that summer at Mandu, when candles were floated on tiny boats, an idea suggested by the ladies of the harem. They would have watched unseen, hidden from the sight of the male guests. Every new day that Sir Thomas Rowe woke up in his makeshift home at Mandu, it became more and more clear that he was getting nowhere in his main task, that of winning a trading agreement for Britain's East India Company. And by now he was well aware of the reason. He was often with the Emperor, who seemed very friendly. But he was nowhere near the real seat of power. That lay, unseen, behind the throne, in the shape of a woman, famous in India's history. She was Jahangir's favourite wife, Noor Jahan. The many portraits of her are all imagined, since no painter would have been allowed to set eyes on the royal women. Nevertheless, she can literally be said to have ruled from within the harem. It's a common Western belief that veiled women, or those in Perda, are totally cut off from the world. But to see them today, seemingly separate in a modern street, is to get perhaps the wrong impression. There were certain advantages to being behind the veil as explained by a woman who herself grew up in traditional Parda. Conducting business face to face is not necessarily uh, advantageous to both parties. And I feel that the woman in Parda had a very special advantage because she was sitting inside, whereas the person she was dealing with, whether it was a businessman, whether it was a property seller, a landlord, whomsoever, was sitting outside. Now he, of course, couldn't see her. And from his point of view, it was like what a modern telephone conversation is, so that you cannot observe the expressions or you cannot see what the, what the other person is actually feeling. Uh, whereas from the woman's point of view, she could observe everything about him. Behind every beautiful carved grill in a mogul palace, there were attentive eyes and ears. Eunuchs would move in and out of the harem with messages and instructions. Some of the mogul women even owned ships which traded overseas. So Jahangir's powerful wife, Noor Jahan, was not so much the exception as the best possible example of what could be achieved from behind the veil. In a garden by the river at Agra, there is an exquisite building which is solid evidence of Noor Jahan's power and wealth. This is the tomb which she built for her father. It's like a perfectly jeweled casket, but done to a monumental scale in the most exacting of crafts. The inlay, in white marble, of intricately shaped and many-coloured stones, each set in so precisely that to the touch alone you could think it an unbroken surface. Using tools which owe nothing to the 20th century, craftsmen in Agra still lay delicate patterns of stone in marble. This workshop is one of about 150 in the city. The 
The Taj Mahal, which at a distance looks pure white, is decorated all over with this kind of inlay on a massive scale. This is the tomb of Nur Jahan's niece. And just a couple of miles upstream from the Taj Mahal is the earlier tomb, the one she built for her father. The most spectacular of Mughal monuments, both for people born into her family and only connected by marriage with the Mughals. The way in which Noor Jahan's family had achieved this position makes a fascinating story. Her father, for whom she built this tomb, was an adventurer from Persia, who made such a name for himself that Jahangir appointed him chief minister. But the family's fortunes only really began when Jahangir fell in love with his chief minister's daughter, Noor Jahan. These are the sort of paintings one can still buy today in Agra's bazaar. We'll make them stand for Jahangir and Noor Jahan. They married. And when her father died, Jahangir appointed in his place, as chief minister, her brother. So already, they had things well buttoned up. The sister, behind the scenes, the brother, in the council chamber. There was one very powerful member of the royal family, Jahangir's favourite son, the headstrong Shah Jahan. And they had a plan for him too. The brother had a beautiful daughter surely the perfect bride for the prince. History would come to know her as Mumtaz Mahal, the favourite one of the palace, the beloved bride for whom Shah Jahan would later build the Taj Mahal. But now this block of power on her brother's side began to distress Noor Jahan, and she hatched a new plot. She had a daughter by a previous marriage, and she now made a favourite of an insignificant son of Jahangir's, someone she could easily dominate and she arranged for these two to marry, thus balancing the board. One of these two princes would inherit the throne, so it is now certain that one granddaughter of the Persian adventurer must become empress. But which? Time would tell, and probably soon, because Jahangir was by now increasingly decrepit. The wild card in this pack was Jahangir's favourite son, Shah Jahan, it was he in this scene being weighed against gold. But the favours suddenly ceased when Noor Jahan turned against him, and he in retaliation was soon in open rebellion against his father and his stepmother, keeping always on the move to avoid the armies which Noor Jahan now sent out against him. This lovely island in the lake at Udaipur is one place where he sheltered for a few months. Here, to the south of the empire, he was far enough away to be safe. Yet it was also important to be within striking distance when his father died. And to add to Shah Jahan's difficulties, Jahangir was now spending more and more of his time in the extreme north. Kashmir, he had discovered, was good for his asthma, with its lakes and its cool mountain air. In the last years of his life, Jahangir came here every summer. Here he could relax and forget the outrage of a rebellious favourite son. And in Kashmir, in 1627, he died. His life, devoted largely to his own pleasure, had strangely brought his empire peace and prosperity. His death would unleash the violence beneath the surface. Lahore was where they took Jahangir's body for burial. A few miles to the north of the Great Mosque, the now stand his tomb and those of the brother and sister who had opposing ideas as to who should succeed him. The tomb of Noor Jahan lies today right up beside a railway line.
and it's a line which separates the losing from the winning side. Beyond the tracks is the tomb of her brother, Asaf Khan, and it is he who lies close to the tomb of Jahangir himself, for it was his side of the family which won in the fight for the succession. In this final struggle, Noor Jahan's position as a woman, ruling from inside the harem, did at last prove a crippling disadvantage. Her brother was able to rally the other noblemen at court, all of them soldiers like himself, to support his son-in-law, Shah Jahan. And he could seal his sister off in the harem, blocking her chain of command to the outside world. Shah Jahan himself was miles away, far to the south of Agra. But here in Lahore, Asaf Khan now declared him emperor. Eventually, a message of warm approval was received from Shah Jahan, and in it he said that it might be a wise precaution if his male relations were to be, in his delicate phrase, sent out of this world. Asaf Khan took the hint and killed not only the rival prince, nor Jahan's son-in-law, but two nephews and two cousins of the new emperor. It was the first time there'd been murders within the imperial family. But Shah Jahan's cruel example was to be often quoted and ruthlessly imitated by his descendants. Meanwhile, Noor Jahan herself was left unmolested, no doubt, because everyone knew she was at last powerless and harmless. Shah Jahan gave her a handsome pension, and she busied herself with the second great tomb she had created. It's less delicate than the jewel of a tomb she built for her father in Agra, except where it really matters, inside. In the marble coffin chamber at the heart of the tomb, Noor Jahan provided the most exquisite of monuments to her husband, the indulgent emperor who had made possible her extraordinary career. The inlay of semi-precious stones in marble was a style introduced in Jahangir's reign. On his tomb, it achieves perfection. White marble, supremely worked, was to be the hallmark of the reign of his son, Shah Jahan, but while the surface of Mughal court life was approaching its most brilliant era, so were the internal cracks appearing which would bring the edifice tumbling down. The Taj Mahal is famous not only for its unrivaled beauty, but because it has, at its heart, a love story. The love of the Emperor Shah Jahan for his wife, Mumtaz Mahal. Just three years before the tragedy which caused the Taj Mahal to be built, there had been a joyful family reunion here in the Red Fort at Agra between Shah Jahan, Mumtaz Mahal and two of their children. The family was exceptionally close. This island in the lake at Udaipur, 400 miles southwest of Agra, is the best place to imagine Shah Jahan with his young family. And from their life together here, one can understand something of why he was so attached to his wife that nothing less than the Taj Mahal would do as her monument. For the last few years of his father's reign, Shah Jahan had been in open rebellion against him, constantly moving about to avoid capture. But he didn't send his wife and children to some distant place of safety. Instead, wherever he went, Mumtaz Mahal came with him and we know that they took all important decisions together. One dry statistic will suggest how little they were apart. In the 19 years of their marriage, she bore him 14 children. The family stayed here at Udaipur for four months in 1623, as guests of the ruler, who was himself no friend to the Mughal court and was happy to entertain such a powerful rebel. This little palace, then newly built, is believed to be where Shah Jahan and Mumtaz Mahal lived. At the time, their eldest son, Dara Shuko, was seven, and the prince seen here in green, Aurangzeb, was five. 
Those children who played together in this courtyard would later become enemies to the death. Here the swords were make-believe, but already life held genuine dangers. Soon the two boys were to set off together on a terrifying real-life adventure. Shah Jahan, weary of constant pursuit, made a deal. As a token of his own good behaviour, he would send his two young sons to live at court as hostages. So for two years, they were separated from their parents, who prudently remained well out of reach, far from the centre of things. Then, Jahangir died. Shah Jahan moved swiftly north to seize the throne, and he and Mumtaz Mahal were securely established in the Red Fort at Agra when the two boys arrived for that family reunion. All seemed to have come out perfectly after their times together of hardship and danger. But the new emperor had only three years in which to enjoy his good fortune. His wife died giving birth to their 14th child. Shah Jahan was desolate. He gave up his gorgeous clothes and jewels and consoled himself only in the great task of keeping at least her name alive for countless generations to come. The phrase Taj Mahal, which has ever since echoed round the world, is just his wife's own name abbreviated, Mumtaz Mahal. It means the favourite of the palace. The Taj has always been a holy place, a Muslim shrine for pilgrimage and prayer. But it is also a place of pride and affection for all the people of India, the best possible choice for an outing with all its attendant pleasures. People ask, who is the architect? Apparently, no one. It seems that Shah Jahan and his masons together devised this final perfect flowering of the architectural traditions of Persia and of Muslim India. Shah Jahan now increasingly devoted himself to architecture not only in the Taj itself, but in many other projects. He began entrusting affairs of state more and more to his sons, but he made clear distinctions between them. His favourite was the eldest, Dara Shuko, whom he now kept always by his side, leading a civilised but relatively pampered life at court. By contrast, the younger son, Aurangzeb, was constantly sent out on military campaigns learning the tough trade of a soldier on the distant frontiers of the empire, just as his father had before him. The Mughal Empire had by now long been secure throughout the great plain of North India, within its natural boundaries of mountains and sea. A grand trunk road through this fertile plain was the backbone of the empire, and it was on the great cities along this route, Lahore, Delhi, Agra, that Shah Jahan now concentrated his energies. The famous painted lorries of Pakistan reveal that this is the northwest end of the Grand Trunk Road. And it was here in Lahore that Shah Jahan now built one of the greatest of Mughal gardens. The Shalimar Bagh suggests perfectly one very Mughal concept of earthly pleasure the soothing delights of water. Like Delhi and Agra, Lahore has its Mughal fort. Though much altered in later centuries, some parts do still recall the shimmering white elegance of Shah Jahan's architecture.
In Delhi, the next important place moving southwest along the Grand Trunk Road, Shah Jahan created from scratch a bustling city as well as a fort. He had decided to move his capital here from Agra. What is now known as Old Delhi was in his time a completely new town. The main street, Chan Nichauk, leads straight towards the Lahore gate of the fort, known like its older counterpart in Agra as the Red Fort. Shah Jahan's own apartments, all built at the same time, perch on the walls on the other, quieter side. And naturally, there had to be a mosque. Three and a half centuries ago, the Muezzin first called the faithful to prayer in Shah Jahan's new Jama Masjid, or Friday Mosque. Just as today, except that loudspeakers now give his chant an eerily electronic quality. the mosque, as round any cathedral in Europe in the old days, the traders are busy. This is the market for cereals and spices. There's no space here for four-legged beasts of burden. It's accepted today, as it always has been, that there is only one way to shift the commodity to the customer. At Agra, too, the Red Fort had much benefited from Shah Jahan's passion for architecture. Within the red sandstone walls built by his grandfather, he had added his own characteristic white marble mosque and pavilions. And because the fort here has been less altered than in Delhi, this is the best place to imagine the emperor's daily life. From his private quarters here, looking east, the sun rises behind the Taj Mahal. Every day, as the sun rose, Shah Jahan would appear from his marble apartments on the east wall of the fort to let the people below know that he was alive and well and like the sun, busy on their behalf. It was his grandfather Akbar who had first timed this daily appearance to coincide with the rise of the sun. But both he and Jahangir then went back to bed for a couple more hours of sleep. Shah Jahan was made of sterner stuff. Reached by a steep and narrow staircase, Behind his apartments, there is a mosque, probably the smallest in the world. Here, answering the Muezzin's call an hour before dawn, Shah Jahan had begun his day with a session of private prayer in this very private mosque. Meanwhile, his superb hall of public audience was filling up with those who had any business that day with the emperor. Here, a little before eight, to the sound of hidden drums and trumpets, he would appear in his throne alcove, seated on his famous peacock throne. And the emperor Shah Jahan 
used to ride a peacock throne, which was made of diamonds and jewels. It was later on was taken by Nadir Shah to Iran. This is one of the most spacious buildings here. Nobles and ministers they stood for the judgment of the king, and they were provided golden and silver sticks, like your shooting sticks, to hang on if they fell tired. The servants whisking flies from the imperial presence stood on the heads of two golden elephants. And the business conducted here was as formal as this picture suggests. Behind the hall of public audience is a courtyard to which in those days only a few trusted ministers and servants would be admitted. Here Shah Jahan would retire after his public appearance to carry on with the real business of state in the equivalent of a cabinet meeting. This took place in his hall of private audience, a cool marble pavilion with views over the river. When the business of state was completed, it was already past noon, time for the emperor to slip into the harem for a meal. Here he presided over another court. It consisted only of women and eunuchs, but it was organized much like the one outside. Out of sight, behind what a writer of the time called the screens of purity, there lived a thriving community, abounding in gossip and rumor, and alive with intense ambitions and jealousies, as everyone competed for the favor of a single and almost unlimited source of wealth, the emperor himself. The emperor lived in his harem in a state of pampered isolation. At meals, for example, he alone would eat, sitting cross-legged on rich carpets. All around, set on white calico cloths, would be dozens of gold and silver vessels, each filled with a separate delicacy. To either side of him, a beautiful girl would be kneeling. The emperor would point to a particular dish, a eunuch would hand it to the girl, and the girl would serve him. After lunch, a siesta, with or without a girl, followed by an afternoon visit to a mosque for more prayers. And then, any further discussion with his ministers that might be needed, before returning finally to the harem for supper this time with musical entertainment provided by the women. By 10 o'clock, Shah Jahan was in bed. A woman chosen for her soothing voice would read to him. His favorite book was the diary of his ancestor, Babur, telling how he had captured India. In four generations, from nothing to all this, it was most satisfactory. Shah Jahan had seized the throne by force, but he was determined to hand it on peacefully to his favorite, Dara Shuko, the elder of the two boys who had been held as hostages before his own accession. These beautiful paintings are from an album which Dara Shuko gave to his bride when he was 25, and they are typical of the man. He loved the arts and literature. Indeed, he had become by now one of the most civilized members of his dynasty. By contrast, Dara Shuko's brother, and most likely rival for the throne, Aurangzeb, was being toughened rather than civilized by the passing years, being almost permanently away at war. Orcha was where Aurangzeb's military skills were first revealed. The Raja here was unruly, so Shah Jahan sent Aurangzeb, still only 16, to reassert imperial authority. He did so, and entertained his father in the Raja's own palace. Father and son now perpetrated an outrage which was a major change of policy. They demolished the local Hindu temples. The young Aurangzeb was beginning in the way he meant to continue. Soon he was adding spectacular further conquests. 
even the great southern city of Hyderabad would eventually fall to him. It was famous then, as it is now, for its jewels. Much wealth was sent from here to the Mughal court, and Aurangzeb should have been able to expect gratitude from his father. Instead, his capture of this city only revealed the obstacles that were now being put in his way. Five miles from the city is the fort of Golconda, the stronghold of the royal family of Hyderabad. It was here to escape from Aurangzeb that they now retreated. For if he had been able to capture them, then their kingdom, and not just their jewels, would have fallen to the Mughal Empire. The size of this place is astonishing. This courtyard is already halfway up inside the fort, but there's still all that rocky way to go before you reach the small palace at the top, where the royal family had taken refuge. Even from here it looks almost impossible to winkle them out. And yet it seems that Aurangzeb had a good chance of doing so. And it was that news, when it reached the ears of Dara Shuko in the court at Delhi, which caused the trouble. He wasn't going to have his ambitious younger brother scoring a success on this scale. Admittedly, there were agents from here offering him bribes to intercede on Golconda's behalf, and he did take their money. But he could honestly claim that it didn't influence his decision. His interests and theirs already exactly coincided. So he persuaded his father, the emperor, to command Aurangzeb, who had in his sights a possible great victory for the Mughal Empire, to withdraw his forces. It was exactly the sort of frustration to fuel Aurangzeb's leaping ambition. The crisis came when Shah Jahan fell ill in the following year, 1657, and temporarily handed over the business of government to Dara Shuko. But Aurangzeb and another younger brother doubted whether the arrangement would be temporary. They decided to move. Dara Shuko was at the center of the empire in Delhi. The younger brother, Murad Baksh, was campaigning in the southwest. He now proclaimed himself emperor and set off north with his army. Aurangzeb, further south, was more canny. No mention of being emperor. He merely said he would help his brother to free his father from the treacherous Dara Shuko. It was on a hot summer's day under a blazing sun that the two armies met on an open, dusty plain south of Agra. On one side, the somewhat scruffy joint forces of the two younger brothers, unglamorous to look at, but their men hardened in distant campaigns. On the other, the imperial army, headed by Dara Shuko. An eyewitness has left an account of his magnificent force as it moved out from Agra. Ranks of elephants in immaculate shining armor, squadrons of cavalry with gleaming lances. But the same account goes on to say that most of those soldiers were not very fierce, being barbers, blacksmiths, butchers, carpenters, tailors and such like. A peacetime army under a peacetime general. The midday sun was so hot that men's skin was blistered by their armor. In spite of the barbers and the tailors, it was quite a close-fought battle, but in the end it was Dara Shuko who turned and fled back to Agra. He stopped just long enough to collect his family and a few favorite slave girls and set off with them on fresh elephants to Delhi. And with that ignominious flight by the intended heir to the throne, the tide turned towards his younger brother, Aurangzeb. It was two days later that Aurangzeb and his victorious army arrived outside the Red Fort in Agra, where his father, Shah Jahan, waited, his plans for the inheritance in ruins. Any negotiations here in the fort would be without Prince Murad, who had been badly wounded in the battle. Shah Jahan opened the matter by sending a sword of honor to Aurangzeb with an invitation to visit him. Aurangzeb replied that he would only do so if his father handed over the fort to Aurangzeb's men. Shah Jahan declined, whereupon Aurangzeb laid siege to his father. 
Cannon fire didn't achieve much against these great walls. Sealing off the water supply proved more effective. After three days, Shah Jahan surrendered. Aurangzeb never came in to see his father, and Shah Jahan would never again leave this fort. This beautiful tower became his prison, and his life here was made steadily more bleak. Even his jewels were removed by the servants of his grasping son. All that he managed to keep with considerable difficulty was his pearl praying beads. There was plenty of time now for prayer, and he became, in the way perhaps of old men in adversity, increasingly devout. For the fifth of the great moguls, the imperial days were over. There were some consolations. He did have a devoted daughter to look after him. There was comfort in the Quran. And he was allowed to stay here in his private apartments, with their beautiful view made infinitely more so by the great monument, which he himself had created to his wife, and to happier days, when she was alive and their sons were busy only with nursery battles, instead of the fight to the death on which they would now embark. Learning the words of the holy book by heart. In many societies, the basis of religious education. These are children in a mosque in India. This kind of learning is seen as instilling two virtues, knowledge of the Quran and a sense of discipline. Adults now in the mosque at Lahore. The sense of discipline in a shared belief and cause strikes anyone who attends the Friday service in a mosque. It was a mood which would be put to political use by the last of the great moguls, Aurangzeb. Aurangzeb was unusual among the great moguls in being painted kneeling at his prayers. His ancestors had preferred not to draw attention to any being superior to themselves but he saw himself as a humble warrior in the service of Islam. The word means submission to the will of God. When Aurangzeb was a young man, many Muslims in India felt a sense of grievance against his family. The Mughal Empire had been stabilized largely by involving the Hindus. Under Aurangzeb, the frontiers would be vastly extended, and he himself would spend much of his life fighting in the south. But his most passionate aim was to turn India into a more orthodox Islamic state. Violence between the two great communities of India, Hindus and Muslims, is nothing new. The tragic events of 1947, when India and Pakistan became independent countries, were merely the most extreme example. The question of how far the ruling Muslim minority should tolerate the pagan practices of the Hindus was an important one in Aurangzeb's youth, when he was just one of several rival princes. The natural heir to the throne, Dara Shuko, profoundly disagreed with his younger brother Aurangzeb. He believed in encouraging all religions equally, which Aurangzeb considered heresy. <laughs> The Quran gives clear guidance. Muslims must allow Jews and Christians to worship freely, but should place restrictions on other religions. It had been Mughal policy to lift these restrictions from the Hindus, but this offended the more orthodox in the Muslim community. It was this indignation felt by many of the Muslims which Aurangzeb would use in his struggle for the throne. His family had betrayed the faithful. He would defend the faith. There were three people with cause for complaint when Aurangzeb declared himself emperor in 1658. One was his father, Shah Jahan, the rightful emperor, whom Aurangzeb had captured and imprisoned. Another was Dara Shuko, 
Shah Jahan's favourite and his intended heir. And then there was a younger brother, Murad Baksh, whom Aurangzeb had once proclaimed as the prince who should succeed, instead of the heretic Dara Shuka. When it finally came to a pitched battle, Dara Shuka was defeated by the combined armies of his younger brothers. And from that moment, Aurangzeb, seen here in green, systematically set about removing each of these three living obstacles to his own rule. His immediate concern was his elder brother. Dara Shuko had fled from the battlefield on his elephant. With his father's blessing, he had then ridden fast to seize the imperial treasure. The intention was to buy himself another army with which to fight Aurangzeb. The first stop was Shah Jahan's new fort at Delhi. Here there was great wealth, but Aurangzeb was hard on his heels. The same thing in Lahore, again vast treasure, again no time to transform it into trained soldiers. After six months in remote places, Dara Shuka did at last return with an army, and the two rivals confronted each other in the hills surrounding the town of Ajmer, some 300 miles south of Lahore. These marble pavilions by the lake at Ajmer were built for Shah Jahan, two of whose sons were now fighting their final battle a few miles away. And on the day of that battle, there could be seen here a strange assembly of elephants, women and children, eunuchs, all nervously waiting. They were Dara Shuko's harem with the remains of his treasure. They were ready to set off at a moment's notice because he told them that if he lost the battle, he would join them here so that they could flee together into the desert to escape his murderous brother. Well, he did lose the battle. And in the chaos, he managed to miss even this vital rendezvous. The women and the eunuchs waited here as long as they could and then fled without him. Miraculously, they managed to join up with him a few weeks later. But ahead lay an ultimate betrayal. Shah Jahan had sentenced a local ruler to be trampled to death by elephants. And Dara Shuko had saved the man's life, pleading the special influence of a favorite son to ask for pardon. Now surely was the time to call in old debts. Dara and his family arrived in the man's territory. For a few days, they were royally entertained. And then, most treacherously, Dara Shuko and his 15-year-old son were seized. The ruler had decided where his best advantage lay. An elephant set off north with a closed howdah bearing Dara Shuko and his young son as prisoners. Their destination, Delhi and Aurangzeb. Today's old town in Delhi was then new. It had been recently built, close to the Red Fort by Shah Jahan. It was here that Aurangzeb now organized a charade to humiliate his elder brother. It very nearly misfired. At this sort of height above the street, Dara Shuko and his young son were paraded through Old Delhi. They were dressed in rags, smeared with dirt and seated on a skinny female elephant. The people of Delhi were supposed to jeer, but they didn't. Dara Shuko had been a generous and popular prince. There was resentment at his humiliation, and that gave added urgency to the next stage of Aurangzeb's plan. Learned and holy men play an important part in the legal system of Islam. And Aurangzeb now set up a committee of such people to advise on the fate of his brother, whom he described as the chief of the atheists. The holy men, after due consideration, recommended death. Aurangzeb then let it be known that he himself would have preferred exile for his brother, but he bowed to religious authority, and the deed was soon done. Next in line was the younger brother, Murad Baksh, who had once been Aurangzeb's ally, but now found himself his prisoner. Aurangzeb kept him in the impregnable fortress of Gwalior. He had captured him by a ruse which violated not only brotherly ties, but even the laws of hospitality. Aurangzeb had invited Murad to dine in his tent at a time when they were still allies. Aurangzeb himself was much too pious a Muslim to touch alcohol, but there was plenty of wine for Murad. 
And afterwards, Aurangzeb suggested a soothing massage from a beautiful slave girl. Murad fell asleep, knowing that his own guard was standing watch over him to warn of any danger. But the guard was cleverly distracted for a moment and was silently strangled. Murad awoke to find himself a prisoner. That same night, four elephants set off from Aurangzeb's camp in four different directions. Each carried a closed howdah, making it hard for any rescue party to decide which to pursue. The one with Murad Baksh inside delivered him to a succession of prisons, and eventually to the dark security of Gwalior. It was not enough for Aurangzeb to keep Murad prisoner. However secure he might be deep in the dungeons at Gwalior, he wanted him dead. And he achieved that by a piece of hypocrisy that was typical of the man. Murad had once had a man murdered, and that gave Aurangzeb his chance. Under Muslim law, only the relatives of the murdered man can demand justice. Aurangzeb now sought out those relatives. The eldest son refused to take action, but the second son was persuaded to bring a case, and the judge found Murad guilty. The second son could still have accepted money for his father's life, but with due prompting, he refused any payment, which left only death as the penalty. Aurangzeb, apparently with the deepest regret, said that the law was the law and the guilty man must die even if he did happen to be the emperor's brother. But to emphasize his own personal distaste for vindictiveness, he rewarded not the second son, but the eldest one, for refusing to indulge in vendetta. Only one man living could now deny Aurangzeb's claim to the throne, the prisoner in the red fort at Agra, Shah Jahan, even Aurangzeb couldn't kill his father, he left that to time. And after eight years, the old man died. A boat brought him to his final reunion. For eight years, he had gazed from his marble cell at his most astonishing creation, and never once been allowed to visit his wife's tomb. Now his body was brought the mile or so down the river from the fort to the Taj, to lie once again beside Mumtaz Mahal, beneath the very center of that superb dome. For the Hindu majority, Aurangzeb's firm hold on the throne was unwelcome news. The Quran says that unbelievers must pay a special tax. Aurangzeb's great-grandfather, Akbar, had freed them from this, in the tolerant mood of which Aurangzeb so strongly disapproved. Aurangzeb, having less interest in communal harmony, now reintroduced the much-hated tax. It was in the ancient and powerful Hindu city of Jodhpur that opposition to Aurangzeb first came to a head. Above the marketplace, the tower is one of the most spectacular forts of Rajasthan. The family holding this fort had been closely allied with the Mughals ever since the time of Akbar. Now they became restless, and Aurangzeb sent his favorite son, also called Akbar, with a large army to bring this place under control. But the Jodhpur royal family made most tempting proposals to the young prince. His bigoted father, they said, was tearing the empire apart. What India needed was a broad-minded Mughal emperor, like the great Akbar, whose name the prince shared. If their Rajput army, they suggested, were combined with his Mughal army, they could together overthrow his father and place a new Akbar on the throne. The Rajputs were famous fighters. The plot seemed a good one. The prince agreed to join them. For Aurangzeb, it was a most dangerous moment. He happened to be not far away, but he was directing a much smaller force from his red imperial tent. Only the emperor used a red tent. 
and in effect it's a version in canvas and embroidery of the white marble columns and arches among which he would hold private audience when at home in a palace. This is in the museum in Jodhpur Fort and is the only one of its kind to have survived. But as Aurangzeb sat in his tent, he was aware that this time he would only be saved by his own genius for deception. He set to work. He knew that his son would not march into battle except on a day approved by his astrologers. Well, naturally, Aurangzeb had spies in his son's camp. And they now bribed the astrologers to look into their charts and to find there that, to be absolutely certain of good luck, a little delay was advisable. That delay gave Aurangzeb time to bring up more troops. Even so, he couldn't match the combined force of his son's army and the Rajputs. But he had another age-old trick up his sleeve. As the opposing armies moved closer, with battle almost certain on the next day, Aurangzeb wrote a letter to his son, congratulating him on the brilliant way in which he had brought such a large Rajput army into the trap which they had together prepared for them. The letter was smuggled into his son's camp, and it was arranged for it to fall into Rajput hands. Overnight, the Rajput army vanished, and when that was discovered, young Akbar fled as well. His father was not the man to be so easily toppled. The area into which Akbar headed was the wild, mountainous region south of the Mughal Empire, known as the Deccan. This was the part of India which successive Mughal emperors had found most difficult to subdue. The reason was simple, but not simple enough to deter Aurangzeb. This was perfect terrain for any guerrilla force, striking unexpectedly at a conventional army and then vanishing. And during Aurangzeb's reign, a ruler had emerged here who was a classic leader of guerrillas. His statue can be found today in many Indian towns because he became, in our own century, a symbol of how Hindus could drive out oppressors, by implication, the British. His name was Shivaji, and his successes, according to one Indian historian, proved that the Hindu race can build a nation. The countryside, inland from Bombay, is dotted with forts, which Shivaji captured and held, such as this one at Panhala, this dramatic figure in Panhala suggests very well what Shivaji came to stand for. It's a modern statue of one of the generals who fought with him against Aurangzeb, but its spirit of bravado, like something from a child's book of legends, is exactly in keeping with Shivaji's own image. He came to seem almost like Robin Hood, mercilessly teasing and baiting the much more powerful moguls in exploits which were often positively cheeky. Once, he and his men cut a hole in the outer fence of a Mughal camp and made their way right to its center, in among the general's harem, killing many of his attendants before slipping away again. On another occasion, he himself escaped from Mughal captivity by being carried out hidden in a large basket of cakes and sweets. This romantic character had died the year before Aurangzeb's son rebelled, and the young prince came down to these regions to join forces with Shivaji's son. Aurangzeb decided to pursue him south to punish this impertinent alliance. It was to be a turning point, not only in the reign, but even in the history of the entire Mughal Empire itself. Aurangzeb was already 62. He would grow old campaigning in the south, trying to subdue this turbulent region long after his son Akbar had thought better of it and slipped away to Persia. The heartland of the Mughal Empire had long been this area. Aurangzeb would add vast territories to the south, and in the last 27 years of his life, he never once set foot outside this area, representing a drastic change of policy. With this move south, the center of gravity of the Mughal Empire shifted. The places connected with Aurangzeb are all down here. Aurangabad, the city named after himself, which he virtually made his capital. The numerous Hindu forts which he constantly tried to wrest from the followers of Shivaji, such as Panhala. And the capital cities of the two great southern Muslim kingdoms which he was determined to conquer, Hyderabad and Bijapur. Both had held out against his ancestors. Both, to his great pride, would fall to him. 
Bijapur after a long siege in 1686. And at Hyderabad, the next year, he captured the greatest fort of all. But his men finally got inside these defences not by force of arms, but by bribery. Money would increasingly become the only way his sieges were brought to a successful end. Through this countryside, Aurangzeb would move back and forth with half a million people, his army and camp followers. But however far they marched, and however many forts they took possession of, the situation somehow never seemed to get any better. This hilltop fort of Panhala is typical of the frustrations of Aurangzeb's last years. Soldiering on well into his eighties, he was like an old bear plagued by bees. He would take a fort and fill it with his soldiers, and then as soon as he'd moved on, the enemy would take it back again. He'd first captured this one in 1691, and now, ten years later, here he was, back again, trying to capture it once more. And it's at that moment that we have an unexpectedly vivid picture of the stubborn old man. Most improbably, at this place, miles from anywhere, a British ambassador arrived from the court of William III, hoping to open up trade. He found chaos, a vast insanitary camp, deep in mud, with despair and corruption and drunkenness among the troops. The shining exception was Aurangzeb himself, now aged 82. The ambassador describes him passing through the camp to visit the siege works. He was all white, robe, turban, beard. He was carried through the crowd on an open litter, but he never once looked up from the book he was reading, undoubtedly the Quran. As another European visitor wrote, he had by now a craze for being held a saint. He was 89 when he finally died, and he died as he had hoped, on a Friday, the Muslim holy day, just after saying his prayers. This building, a few miles from Agra, is an example of how affairs at the center of empire had gone from bad to worse during Aurangzeb's long absence. It is the tomb of his great-grandfather, Akbar, a holy place indeed for the family. Yet this tomb was now pillaged by the local population. Its gold and silver plate was removed and its rich carpets. It was just one example of the anarchy which would destroy the empire towards the end of Aurangzeb's reign and after his death. Aurangzeb's own grave could hardly provide a greater contrast. It's in the south, 15 miles from Aurangabad at Kuldabad. No great gateways and gardens and terraces here. Just small whitewashed courtyards leading to a flight of three steps. This is all that Aurangzeb's tomb consists of. A space, the size of a small room, and a bare patch of earth open to the sky. Exactly in keeping with what the Quran specifies and with his own image that he had always liked to project, that of a simple Muslim, just one of life's pilgrims. But in another way, this cramped space symbolizes the poverty of mind he had brought to the more generous tradition of his ancestors. With their flamboyant ability to enlist everyone's talents, Hindus and Muslims alike, in their cause. An idea which had once amply justified that resounding phrase, the great moguls. This grave fulfills a very precise religious requirement. But it was very different from what India had come to expect of her emperors. The sixth great mogul was dead. And the empire, dead with him. Many of the later Indian princes were descended from men who grabbed parts of the Mughal Empire after Aurangzeb's death. It was in the resulting chaos that the British stepped in, just as the Mughals had three centuries earlier. Aurangzeb's descendants were still officially emperors, though increasingly powerless, 
until at last the imperial title was transferred to Queen Victoria. The British Raj certainly had its own moments of splendor, in a tradition of pomp and ceremony which continued right up to the end of empire in 1947. But it would be hard to maintain that any rulers of India, before or since, have ever shown quite the flair and the style of the great moguls.